hats, by the way. I'll tell you later after the show. Hi, everyone. <laughs> My name is Rosette Truen. I am the host of um, this special show, Fight CPS with Miss G. I have a wonderful attorney. His name is Matthew Harris. He's in Texas. And um, I want everyone to hear what he has to say because I have referred a lot of uh a lot of people to him and I got a call from a couple of them last year and they told me that he won the case for them. I cannot disclose the names for you, but um, I would like attorney um, Harris to share with you guys his opinion about CPS. When is the right time to hire an attorney and CPS's tactics and how they prevent you from hiring an attorney and the reason behind it. Um, and um, I want to give the floor also to Attorney David, I mean, Attorney Matthew, to explain to everyone which county he's willing to take, okay? Because there's so many counties in, in, in um, um, Texas that he can't take on all of them. And also, my next other question to Attorney Matthew is um, if he knows anyone in other counties in Texas that also handles CPS cases that he does not handle in that county or counties um, to have a network for others as well to be able to call them and get them to help them in their CPS case. So I told you, Matthew, thank you for joining me. I've known you for a while now and I admire you and I respect you so much because you have an amazing uh, track record and helping other families gaining custody of their children. I am also proud of you because you expanded your office. Last time we spoke, you said you expanded your office and you have more attorneys helping you in this fight. And I just want everyone to hear you and know everything they need to know about you. Well, thank you, Ms. G. You are far too kind to me. I don't deserve any of that credit and praise. I'm just uh, thankful to know friendly people like you. Uh, you're right. There, there are there are 254 counties in Texas, and so I am located up in Lubbock, Texas, which is in West Texas, up uh, near the Panhandle. Um, I handle cases in about a hundred mile radius of here. Uh, unfortunately, I can't take cases in all of Texas because CPS cases do require a lot of hearings, and so. Um, I'd say about 99% of my cases, or my CPS cases anyway, are located in Lubbock County because I'm right across the street from the courthouse. And so I can walk over there for all the hearings that are necessary. Wow, that's convenient. That's amazing. <laughs> you just walk to court. I love that part. So what other counties that you're willing to take on? Oh, let's see. I'm going to pull up a map here. Mm -hmm. Let's see, from Lubbock over to Hockley and Cochran, uh, Bailey, Lamb, Hale, Floyd, Motley, Cottle, King, Dickens, Crosby, Yoakum, Terry, Lynn, Garza, Kent, uh, Gaines County, Dawson, Borden, Scurry, and then also up to uh, Palmer, Castro, Swisher, Briscoe, and Hall. Uh, I've taken a couple of cases up in Amarillo before, or at least that area, but Amarillo is about 100 miles away for us. And so that's about the limit. Honestly, you know, I'm, I'm fine with taking cases anywhere in Texas. The problem is that most people don't want to pay my hourly rate while I drive nine hours to the other side of Texas to get to each hearing and then pay for my hourly rate to drive back. It just right. gets expensive. It is. It, well, it's not. It's not. It's not cheap fighting the state, the county, um, the the state attorney, the county attorney, the children attorney. It's like the attorney ha is going against all of them, and oftentimes I get calls from parents where they think it's easy, pre breezy case for attorneys. It's not, because every case is dif is different. And I hear a lot of clients. I mean, a lot of potential clients actually, parents who think that the social workers are really going to place the children with them. And they go through the hoops of the unification classes, the this, the that. None of that happens. And then they find out too late that their case is going to TPR. 
uh, termination of parental rights. And once the rights, I don't know if this is the same case in Texas, once the parents' rights are terminated, the relatives' rights are also revoked from seeing the children. Am I correct? Correct. Except here's one thing different that I see in my practice. So it's not this way in every county in Texas, but mm -hmm. at least here in Lubbock, the department, whenever they file a removal of the children from the parents' homes, on day one of 100% of the cases that I've ever seen, I mean, over my 12 years of practice, 100% on day one, the department requests termination of parental rights. Day one. I had a whistleblower on my, case, on my show before about a, almost a month ago, and she said that when she became a foster parent, she became an adoptive foster parent because her and her husband couldn't adopt, I mean, couldn't have children. And the social worker asked her what type of baby they want, uh, what color skin the baby should be, what color hair the baby should be, eyes. And she literally, literally said that she had a choice to make. So oftentimes when they remove children, people don't understand, parents don't understand that they would remove your children and place them immediately in an adoptive home because she has the age of the child. They know what type of child they want color skin of the child, that's how far they get. And um, have you witnessed that in your career, Attorney Harris? Uh, unfortunately, uh, my, I can't say that I have ever had a case where uh, they have admitted to doing that, but yes, usually whenever they do these placements, that is one of the things that they are asking these uh, foster parents is whether or not they are willing to be adoptive placements at some point. And so, um, unfortunately, I, I have known some foster parents who went the foster route in order to adopt rather than going through an adoption agency because they saw that as a faster route to adoption. And yeah. it's it's sad. It, it's sad that uh, children can sometimes be treated like a commodity, you know, out there on the market for uh, potential parents, you know, adoptive parents, foster parents to go shopping at um, because parents' rights are a fundamental constitutional right. And that's one of the reasons that I fight so hard to protect parents' rights is because of that, I, I believe so strongly in our constitution and those constitutional rights. And that's one, one of many reasons why I respect you. I have so much respect for you and you're so humble. When I compliment you, even when you and I are talking on the phone, I always compliment you and you know this, and I meant it. I don't just compliment people I don't believe in. And with you, just your passion alone to defend parents' rights, right? And to do your best to bring their children back is enough for me to respect you, okay? Well, this is you. just out of many reasons, you know, one of them is that exact thing which you just mentioned they have rights and you're defending that right. And what I try to explain to people I speak with is that the Department of Children and Family Services all over the United States violate your rights by placing rules in their entities, in their counties to violate those rights. What are some of the rules, Attorney Matthew, that you can share with us today in your state? You mean some of the uh, rules or the hurdles that yeah, CPS hurdles. parents and that to, to try to prevent them from getting their children back? Correct. Uh, I, I think the number one um, hurdle that's placed in front of parents is uh, after a removal. And this is, you know, after the, the, they've already had the hearing, the court has already found that the children were in a dangerous situation. And so now the parents have an opportunity to essentially win their children back by completing the necessary services. One of those that I find the most burdensome is the obligation for the parents to attend counseling and comply with the counselor's recommendations because it's so broad. We, whenever you uh, have a court order, you know, where your rights can be terminated by not following that court order and the court order says, You've got to go to this counselor and you have to do what this counselor says. Uh, even that court order is very unclear about 
how high you have to jump to, to get over that hurdle because we have no clue what the recommendations of the counselor are going to be. And but we always can count on what we can we can assume what it will be because usually our assumptions are right. Their goal is not to reunify them with their family period. That's why they lose funding if the kids are placed with family members. And that's why the law states, at least in California that I know of, children should be placed with family or best uh, or, or family friends home first. Family Correct. first. But here in California, what I have witnessed is that they place them for temporarily, then they'll come back and say, give a bogus reason as to why they have to remove the children from the grandma and grandpa or why they have to remove the children from the aunts and the uncles or whoever they will find a reason that reason is this in california and i know this for a fact attorney harris they would say things like hey i would like you to you know we, you should we need you to become a foster parent and then the grandma and grandpa says no i want you just to be guardianship so I can have my kids work, you know, the mother and father work on their, you know, problems and then be able to get the kids back. Once the grandparents or the relatives say that, they will remove the children immediately from your custody. I mean, from your placement home and then place them in an adoptive foster home. And that's one thing I would like to discuss with you, Attorney Harris. As I mentioned in California, this is what I what I witnessed in Texas. Have you noticed that a lot of the relative members are forced to become foster parents? Well, what I see it pretty often is the that agreed placement or um, maybe it's not even an agreed placement, but the, the department or the, the court determines that that placement with the family member is the, the, the better course of action. And so then some months later, CPS comes in and says, oh, well, you know, this, this, this parent, or I'm sorry, this uh, family member has failed the home study. And so they, the child can't remain there anymore. Mm -hmm. And it, what's frustrating about that is that this home study is conducted by a, a neutral third part. I say neutral. It's someone hired by CPS to come in and do this home study. Mm -hmm. That person who does the home study is not the one that determines whether or not it's pass or fail. They only basically they do an investigation that's what the home study is and then it's cps that takes this you know essentially a neutral report and says oh well this doesn't meet our standards so cps is the one who is determining that your family member has failed and there's something just fatally flawed with that whenever one of the parties is determining whether or not the home study has passed or failed mm -hmm. But isn't that against the law, though? I mean, isn't that against the law for them to be predicting and making those type of decisions and not up to the judge? Well, it's still up to the judge to determine whether or not to move the child. But there's no there's nothing illegal about the unfortunately, there's nothing illegal about the department coming in and claiming that the family member has failed that home study. That's. I, I, I could just as well come in. In fact, I've, I've had cases before whenever um, I've come in and said, well, you know, well, here's what I've determined. I've determined that they passed. <laughs> it's, yeah. just as, it's just as equally ridiculous to come in and say that. Um, but it helps sometimes to have that sort of uh, mentality and to, to be able to, to point out how ridiculous the CPS is being. Right. And, and, and if you can just explain to everyone, why is it so important for them to hire an attorney from day one of the investigation it is so incredibly important I, I i cannot express how important that is because it's so important let, let me it would probably be more helpful for me to give you some examples yes. so um just last september and i think that uh we we i, I was on your show uh right around maybe august of last year just before this law went into effect and uh, Texas has now passed a law that sets out these CPS Miranda rights. And um, in fact, I did a video I, for those of you watching that don't know, I have a, a YouTube channel, uh, Matthew Harris Law, PLLC. And so uh, I put out a video about these new CPS Miranda rights. And so what CPS has to do is upon initial contact, they must inform you of your right to an attorney 
your right to remain silent, your right to refuse searches, uh, your right to consult with an attorney before signing any safety plan. There's just this laundry list of things that they must uh, tell you about, and then they have to give you written notice of all of the allegations against you. The uh, fruit of the poisonous tree side of that is that if they don't advise you of these rights upon initial contact, then all evidence that is collected um, is barred from being used against you in any civil case, not just, you know, in the CPS case, but also any other pending family law case, you know, where you see a, a, a wife call CPS on a husband or a family member call CPS on a couple, uh, you know, like grandparents who are trying to take custody. So even those separate civil cases, any of this illegally obtained evidence is inadmissible. And so even though that is one of those rights, that is one of those absolute fundamental constitutional rights to remain silent, um, I still have seen recently where CPS has told my client before I was hired that uh, my client had to answer questions. My client must answer her questions about the allegations, even though that would violate the Fifth Amendment. And uh, she even put all of this into writing. She put this into text messages saying, if you don't answer my questions, I'll get a court order that says you have to answer my questions. Mm. Trying to coerce my client into answering questions. Well, um, I took those text messages and I ran them up the chain of command. And guess who is no longer employed at the department anymore? <laughs> oh, my God. So, Please tell me. The social worker. She's gone. Yep. Oh, my yep. God. But they need an attorney like you. To do Absolutely. That. Because you need someone it, because you're so terrified as a parent. Whenever CPS comes in and uh, and threatens that I'm going to go to a judge and get a judge to order you to answer my questions and remove your child from my home. And uh, I've, I've, I've made it my mission to make sure everyone knows that CPS requests termination on day one of removal. So you'd have a parent facing termination of their parental rights or waive their Fifth Amendment right to uh, against self-incrimination and sit for this interview while CPS interrogates them about uh, these uh, cr what are criminal allegations because child abuse, child neglect, those are criminal. And all of this gets handed right over to the DA for prosecution. And so you, whenever you're facing this as a parent, then you're terrified in the moment what you need is an attorney who is that steady hand who can tell you, no, they cannot do this. I'm absolutely certain on the law. I will go to bat for you and defend you. And so that way that parent has that confidence to actually say no. And in that case, the parent said no. There is no application to remove the child from the home. There was there are no court cases pending. And that's been since December. So um that's what you need an attorney for. That that attorney is the one that can step in, that has that knowledge, and also that will to fight. Where sometimes you're you're balancing how much do I give in versus how much do I uh, fight for fear that they're going to hurt uh, hurt their own case if it does go to court. And have you? Well, first of all, you and I when we when you and I spoke about this last year, I was excited. But what did I tell you? I said. I bet you anything they're going to go around it and make excuses somehow, remember, um, yep. to violate that that new law, you know, to violate and go around it. And and um, you said, yeah, most likely they will find some kind of uh, way to go around the law, but you already figured it out. <laughs> you already know what to do. Yeah, it's let's get very, them fired. <laughs> yeah, I know. That's to me, <laughs> to me, that is, the best news I've heard today that a social worker got fired. Well, here's the, here's the, here's the funny part of it. So that case, it's still going on right now, but my client has already told me that it, because by the way, my client video recorded all of these interviews where CPS is threatening him and saying that we're going to remove the child and saying, I'm going to get a court order. Um, if you don't answer my questions, uh, even though she just now had him sign, you know, an acknowledgement that I have the right to remain silent. Um, he recorded all of this and he's already given me permission. And so I'm going to be putting out a video and I'm going to start naming names publicly 
for all of these CPS investigators because I think that the public needs to know and needs to see the face that goes along with these constitutional violators. Oh my God. Uh, okay. I'll on blast. <laughs> Matthew, you have no idea. There's a couple of social workers I want to expose so much by name um, that I have proof of uh, corruption and um, I was told not to on my shows. But if you can do that, that'd be great because I know in California, it's a, a two party consent state. And even, mm. though public, even though government officials should be uh, recorded because they work for the government. And, uh, but again, CPS does not like that. They don't like to be recorded. And we all know why they don't like to be recorded because they lie. Accountability. Accountability. And, and in court, is hearsay works for CPS, social workers. You know Here's here's also because um, I mentioned all these CPS Miranda rights that that now exist. Um, some of those that they must advise the parents of at the very beginning. Remember, at that initial contact, they must advise them of the right to record the social worker. So even though the social worker um, just now told my client, you have the right to record any of our interviews. Mm -hmm. uh, she then goes on to do all of these constitutional violations knowing that she's probably that, that she just now told my client that you have the right to record me how ridiculous is that and that's what that's the scary part is that if they're willing to do that whenever they know that they're being recorded what are they doing whenever they think they're not being recorded that's the scary part for me you know what you you just said it right you nailed it right there but we all know that in court the judges will always take the recommendation of the social workers even if they're lying, even if they're, you know, misusing evidence and, and, you know, coercing parents and all this and children, they still take their recommendation. Am I right? Not always. Uh, I've, and this, 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 this is one of the reasons that, um, that I, I think that I've been successful is that mm -hmm. I have, I've made it a point to find those times where the social worker is lying in court and exposing that perjury so that way they are they, they are exposed once once you catch a social worker lying on the stand at least in our county um we've got a i say a small county we've got about three hundred thousand uh population um but you don't have that many social workers and the judges have very long memories for investigators who lie on the witness stand and that, that, that investigator, they have no credibility after that once you catch them lying. And that's, that's one of the things that, I, that I, I try to make a point during these cases is to hold the social workers to their truths uh, because I have caught them lying on the stand before. But they don't get fired. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. But in, in California, they don't get fired, they get promoted. Oh, but see, here's the beauty, though, is that once they've testified falsely and you catch them, you know, you impeach them on the stand. Uh, I like to get a copy of that transcript. And I just now see I just now saw that Jessica posted that um, comment there about the transcripts, because that's exactly what I do is I'll get that transcript. And the next time that case pops up, then, um, hey, by the way, have you ever been have you ever perjured yourself on the witness stand? Because that goes to the witnesses credibility. <gasps> Oh my God, Matthew, that's great. That's great. But oftentimes, if if they stick with the court appointed attorneys and say that the the client wants to, the parent wants to get a copy of the transcripts, they are denied that. They're denied that. If they have a court appointed attorney, they're denied that. They may have to. Well, if they're indigent, then they are entitled to a free copy of that. Mm -hmm. But you you need that transcript sometimes, and a lot of times for at least for our courts. We don't always have an actual stenographer that's sitting there, you know, typing everything down. Uh, the court will audio record all of the proceedings. And so it's cheap. It's free. It didn't cost anything to get a copy of that audio recording from for the transcript or for the audio recording from that hearing. So there really should be no barrier to getting those transcripts. Right. But there is barrier. All of the, the, the parents I spoke with, and I've been doing this for a while now, as you know, they tell me the same thing. 
the court would not allow me to have copies of the transcripts. Hmm. And even though Davis would tell them, Attorney Davis would tell them, go to the court, get your ID, show them your ID, show them your case number, et cetera, et cetera. They call me on speaker, not speaker, but they put me on speaker. I mute myself and I can hear everything the clerk is telling them. Huh. You need an attorney to request it. You need an attorney to request it for a transcript. Yeah. And this is not just one parent. This is multiple mm -hmm. parents I speak with a day. And they all tell me the same thing. And they actually include me with them so I can hear what the clerk is saying. So what do you, what, what's your intake on what I just said right now? What would you tell parents to do if they come up to that? Situation. Well, I, I I could understand if the um, if the parent is represented by an attorney, and then the parent goes into the clerk to try to get a copy of that transcript, and the clerk says, "Well, hold on, you, you're represented. I I don't want to get between that. Have your attorney request that." I could at least understand that. That's not so much of saying you can't get it. That's more of saying have your attorney request it because I, I don't want to interfere in your attorney client relationship. But if they are absolutely unrepresented and they are appearing pro se, then the, the parent has every bit of right as the attorneys do. So okay. there, there's no reason they should not be able to get those transcripts. Okay. And perhaps it's, it's as simple as just getting the attorney to, or the parent, if they are pro se to uh, put that request in writing. I promise you, it's far better to put these requests in writing and then set them for a hearing. Just make a motion to release the transcript and set that for a hearing because once you bring it to the court's attention, the court has to do something with it. Okay, but oftentimes the court appointed, well, you know this to be true. Oftentimes the court appointed attorneys do not go on and beyond um, for any client of theirs. And I've seen it um, with my own eyes. Attorney Harris, so I mean, I've seen that. So I used to be a, for for our county because uh, I used to be a court appointed CPS attorney. Uh, that's okay. kind of how I got a lot of my start because uh, because in our county the court appointed attorneys it's not like a pool of um, you know these are the court appointed attorneys and that's all they do like a, like a public defender's office. Mm -hmm. Instead, they just have attorneys who have their own private practices in town that have uh, agreed to be on the uh, appointment list. They're the ones who are taking these cases. And so, you know, me being a private attorney, I, I volunteered to be on the list. And so I was a court appointed CPS attorney for probably seven to eight years out, out of my 12 years of practice. You know, Davis did the same thing. I mean, he was there working with them, you know, for about five years, I believe he said. I'm not sure. But have you seen anything abnormal when you work there? Wait, well, I, I didn't work somewhere. That was just in my private office. And I would just get a notice that, hey, by the way, you now represent so-and-so. Here's the order of appointment. And then I hand, from that oh. point, I handled it like every other private case. And so... We'd reach out to the client and say, hey, I've been appointed to represent you. Let me get you in office. And then it was just like any other case. And so um, that's one of the reasons that I ultimately ended up getting off of the appointment list is because uh, I would prosecute these cases and defend these cases with everything I had. And the court started getting upset as to, as to how much money I was costing them because I was doing all of the work. And so they would come in and strike out, like, I'm not paying you because you did that. I'm not paying you for this. I'm not paying you for this. Right. And so my, my normal hourly rate at that time was $200 an hour. And the court appointed rate was $75 an hour. And so $75 an hour, you know, is already a reduced rate for me. But then if you cut off half of my fees, then now I'm working for about $30 an hour. And so I just I could not afford to pay my staff and, you know, keep the lights on right. while doing the work that needed to be done on these cases while the court was cutting a bunch of that work off. So that's that's the reason that I ultimately decided to stop taking on those court appointed cases. And but you also seen the, the, the injustice in this. Um, it's not you can't even give it all you got because they discipline you. 
they actually discipline attorneys. I've heard that from several attorneys in California. I'm not joking. That's why I know a couple of attorneys who do not do CPS cases anymore. They don't want to deal with CPS cases anymore. And um, they're not happy with how they are getting punished, right, for working hard for the client. And they just want them to tell them all they want the, the court wants them to do is tell the clients to comply with CPS, comply with CPS. I'm being honest. That's what they told me that the, the, the court wants them to do is just tell their clients to comply with CPS. They don't need to be there on CFT meetings. They don't need to do this. They can trust the social workers, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what they tell their clients. Have you witnessed that? I've I've never witnessed anything like that where the court is telling the attorneys that you just need to tell them to comply. Mm -hmm. um, I've never seen an attorney disciplined, not in my area anyway. Mm -hmm. I've never seen an attorney disciplined for being a zealous advocate for their clients. Mm -hmm. uh, so long as you're coloring within the lines, you know, of the, the rules of civil procedure and within the statutory guidelines, so long as you are fighting for something that is relevant and fighting for something that um, is within the realm of the law, that's part of being uh, being a zealous advocate for your client. Right. And so, but they don't I, want you to do that because they will. They're not going to pay you for that extra mile you took. No, and they they may not pay for it. But if I'm appointed on a case, I'm going to do it because it's it's the right thing. It's what needs to be done. I agree with you. Um, I've gotten a lot of good feedback about uh, clients you represented, your office represented, and especially you. And they called me and um, thanked me. And they said such good things about you. They actually pray for you. They pray over you every day. And I pray over you every day. And I honestly, it's very rare to find attorneys out of state who have your standards and your values and well thank you and i just want you to know that i i'm so honored to have you on my show today like you have no idea and i wish i can have you on the show every week but i know you have work to do um but i do i follow you by the way i follow you on your you on your youtube and i also follow you on instagram i haven't seen you on tiktok yet you and i talked about that um and I, I am on TikTok. I don't I don't post on there nearly as much, but whenever I do post on there, it's usually it's always the same stuff that I've already posted on YouTube. YouTube is the best place to find my my more recent stuff because we post new videos every Thursday at noon uh, Eastern time. Even okay. though I'm in Texas, I post noon Eastern time. So that way, you know, everyone in the U.S. can see it at least by their lunch hour. OK, good. Yeah. Now everybody can hear that. And also, Jessica, you asked her what county her case is in. She wants to know if you know an attorney in her state. Um, yeah, I, I sure don't. Uh, I see that that's Little Rock. I, I know some attorneys over there in northeast Texas, mm -hmm. um, but in um, Little Rock, I don't know that I need any or I don't know that I know any attorneys up that way. Um, I'll tell you what I do know, though. So um, uh, because even though I might not take a case in one of those counties. Uh, sometimes I might know someone that handles cases in those areas. Um, and so I, I'm part of a, a Facebook group, a, a private Facebook group that's nothing but Texas CPS attorneys. And so I can usually find someone that takes cases in those counties. But as everyone needs to know, the there, there's always a cost for hiring a private attorney. And yeah. so if if you're looking for a private attorney, you should expect to pay uh, at least up two to three, three to four thousand dollars, depending on your area, just to retain an attorney at the very beginning. Um, some attorneys might take just a little bit less money. Like for me, uh, me, for example, if um, it's just the investigation, there's not been anything filed. So basically, all I have to do is talk to CPS and appear with my clients at the interviews. Uh, I can take a smaller deposit for that, like fifteen hundred. Uh, but if something gets filed, then you know additional deposit has to be paid pretty much immediately. Right. And so and that also it, depends on the allegations, right? It also depends on if they open their mouth to the social worker or not. Oftentimes, they open their mouth, they start talking, 
doing the initial investigation and that complicates the matters even worse. You know, for me, that doesn't affect how much that initial deposit is because that, that's dictated by where are you at in the stage of the case? Because if, if they say CPS came to my house and I want an attorney before I ask any questions, then great, you know, I, I can get started for $1,500 because I just work by the hour. I don't have a flat fee or a non-refundable deposit because sometimes if, um, you know, CPS comes to my client's door and uh, I call that caseworker back and I say, hey, guess who's on the case now? Uh, suddenly they don't want to spend very much time talking anymore and I can't understand why. But <laughs> if that case goes away pretty quick, whatever I don't earn, I give back. <laughs> Exactly. And that's, you know what, I've seen cases like that too, where they hire us in the beginning stages and attorney Davis will tell them, nope, um, that social workers, I tell them that they cannot communicate with attorney Davis. He has to communicate with CPS attorney, correct? You cannot communicate with social workers. Am I right in your state as well? Oh, I do all the time because the oh. social worker, well, at the initial investigation, the social worker they don't they have not yet filed a case and so cps that cps in our county is represented by the local district attorney and so our our district attorney there's a criminal district attorney uh side and the the, the district attorney also has a civil side and so the civil side handles things like this so handles the uh, cps cases and so if a case hasn't been filed yet Actually, even after cases have been filed, I still talk to caseworkers throughout the cases here. I don't have to go strictly through the, the DA's office. Um, I want to ask you, Attorney Harris, when, you, when they're in, in a CPS investigation phase, say a social worker left their card on their door and the social, you know, some parents, you know, they kind of get scared. So they usually call if they have nothing to hide, they say. Um, let me call the social workers. I have nothing to hide, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but what would you say about that? What would you say? What, what's your advice on that? Because they do this all the time. They think they're great parents and nothing's going to happen to them. I think you're, you're going to laugh. I think they should do that every single time. As if they see a card on their front door, they need to call them every single time. If CPS comes to your door, you should talk to them every single time. Ask me why. Oh, hell yeah. Why? I do because, not like what I just heard. <laughs> you know I do know you. So it's not you talking to CPS doesn't mean giving them information. Talking to CPS means asking them every question under the sun. So whenever CPS comes to you, let's, let's pretend me for a moment. My son's grown. He's uh, he'll be 22 later on this month. So um, I, I don't have any concern with CPS coming around my house. But if I get it, all of a sudden get a, a card on my door, I'm going to call them back and I'm going to ask them, what are the allegations? I'm going to ask them, um, I, I know that you can't tell me who the reporter was, but can you tell me if it was a professional or a private reporter? Can you tell me, have you spoken with the reporter to uh, substantiate any of these allegations? Have you spoken with the child? Uh, that's all I'm going to do is I'm going to ask 20 questions because now what I've done, you know, pretend I'm a parent, not an attorney here. So now what I've done is I've, I've gathered all this intel and information that I can then take to that CPS defense attorney and say, Look, here's what here is exactly what's going on on the case. These are the questions that I asked because remember, I'm recording it. Um, here are the questions that I asked. Here are their answers, and so here's where we are right now. Now, um, what CPS is going to want to do is they're going to want to ask a lot of questions during that initial phone call or face-to-face -face visit. They're going to ask, "Do you mind if I come in?" Do you mind if I just make sure you have food in the pantry? Uh, do you mind if I just make sure that you have a uh, hot water? I just want to see the child to make sure the child is safe. Um, you know, I'm not going to answer a single question. In fact, for every one of them, I'm going to say, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry. I, I don't answer any questions without my attorney present. Can you tell me what the allegations are? And so then they'll tell me the allegations and then they'll ask, um, does your child go to so-and-so school? Oh, ma'am, I'm sorry. I thought I was clear a moment ago. I don't answer any questions without my attorney present. Now, Miss Social Worker, can you tell me 
And so every time I'm going to stop them in their tracks and say, I'm just as friendly as possible, I'm sorry, I don't answer any questions without my attorney present. I'll, I'll be clearer if you need me to. I don't answer questions without my attorney present. And then I'm going to ask questions all day long. Use that as an opportunity to gather information from CPS. Hmm. I knew you yeah. wouldn't like it, but that's exactly what needs to happen. But, you know, like I, your state is different than our, our state, though, because once the, social, the, the parent opened their mouth, even if they say what you just said, they literally, the social worker would put down on the report something completely different than what happened. And in, in California, they cannot record the social worker. So even if they did record the social worker showing that the parents said, you know, ma'am, I, as I addressed before, I will not uh, answer unless my attorney is present, et cetera, et cetera. Even if their recording shows that they did this, the social worker would write something different in the report and the judge would not allow that recording to be admitted, at, at, you know, admissible as evidence. And that's disgusting. That's Absolutely how disgusting. Is. Yeah. So it's so hard in California for a parent just to say, oh yeah, I have evidence. I, parents have evidence for two years, two years that never, never ever approved to be in court because those evidence shows that the social workers are indeed lying indeed lying but in california they're protecting them they're protecting them well you know i think this is how i would handle that is uh i would uh because i have a, a you know a, a doorbell camera um or i would start the phone call with um hey by the way i'm recording this conversation if you don't consent to recording then you you need to make sure that you hang up perfect That's so perfect. let them know that you're recording and um, if they don't want to be recorded, ask them to pol politely to leave. But when they do that, they come back with the sheriff, right? Three mm -hmm. sheriff cars with guns, and they remove the children without a court order, without a warrant, and they lie and say they have a court order, and they lie and say they have a warrant. So what they do in California, they retaliate against the parent when the parent tells them, a, hey, this call is going to be recorded, or B, I have cameras all around my home. Um, if you don't mind being recorded, you're mo more welcome to come in and check my home. Um, oftentimes when the parents do that, they will be retaliated against. See, here's why I don't mind CPS coming back with the sheriff. Because you know what the sheriff is going to do, right? The sheriff has a body cam right here that's recording everything anyway. Fantastic. That's all I wanted was to make sure that it's going to be recorded. Yes, I hear that part and I agree with you with that part. But we have cases where the all of a sudden the camera did not work that day. Mm, Do you see what I suspect. mean? Yeah. So there there's always a way to go around it. Oftentimes those officers have connection with CPS through marriage, dating. Or family members. Hmm. See, I've never encountered that before. I have. I have. Actually, one of the sheriff officers is married to a social worker in San Bernardino County. Hmm. So, again, oftentimes the parents do not know this unless they hire an investigator. That's how they found out. So, it's very different in Texas, but I also have seen corruptions in Texas. I know you heard about the teenager that um, the social worker was arrested when she was telling the social worker was telling the teenager to be a prostitute and they will share the profit. Yeah, I did. I, I sent you that link a long time ago. Yeah. So there's corruption everywhere. But the ones I think mostly is in California It's the heart of California. That's number one. Um, to be honest, where the most children are being removed and um, the most children are being sex trafficked is the heart of California. So there's a lot of stuff happening. If you haven't seen The Sound of Freedom, I recommend everyone to watch that movie. Um, it's very, very um, alarming and very um, educational. So I've not yet seen that one. That's, that's one of those that, you know, I... I see enough in my job every day. I don't know that I need to go home and, 
you know, watch more of it for fun. Yeah, no, no, no I'm talking about the rest of the people. It's it's not mm. fun, really. It's a, it's a an eye opener movie. I mm. really love that movie. But tell me about a case, or tell us about a case that's so complex that you, nobody thought it was going to be a winning case, and you took it and you won the case. Well, um, without mentioning mentioning names. Sure. Um, here, let me give you some options. Um, first one I'm thinking of is where CPS came in, um, filed a case, and then I sued, I countersued them uh, in the removal case or in the um, order to participate case, and they ended up having to pay over $12,000 in attorney's fees. How about that one? Wow. So wow. that's not a good one. So in in Texas, um, in Texas, if a if a government agency files a frivolous lawsuit, then uh, they will be subject to attorney's fees. And so, in this case, and few people know to use that in um, in CPS cases. And and so, um, in this case, we I represented the parents. The there was an allegation that the a uh, teenage child was being abused and that he wasn't getting the uh, medical assistance that he needed or medical attention that he needed. And so per usual, we sat down, we talked to CPS, we answered the questions related only to the allegations. We never answer questions about the global interview of where you and CPS uh, care as a child. How do you discipline your, or how were you disciplined as a child? We don't answer all that garbage. We talk about the allegations. And so my clients denied the allegations. The child denied the allegations. And I think the child was 15 or 16. And so very competent. And so we even signed a release for the doctor to release the records to show, or at least to talk, not, not to release the records, to talk to CPS to confirm that the child was getting treatment. And lo and behold, uh, about a month later, clients get hit with a lawsuit for uh, an order to participate in services, or maybe it was an order to aid investigation. And so I hit them right back with a frivolous motion because here we were, we had done everything that had been asked of us. There were, there were no grounds to seek an order of participate uh, to aid investigation because CPS had already spoken with the child. And so right away, CPS says, um, you know what? Um, we'll just, we'll just pay that. <laughs> and so we got a settlement agreement from them to pay those amounts. And I made sure to put in the settlement agreement that it's not confidential. It doesn't have to remain quiet. Uh, and I put in there specifically that these attorney's fees were being paid under that frivolous law provision. And then I filed it for public record. I love you, Matthew. That's so amazing. <laughs> Because I received a call about a couple of weeks ago, and she told me that the, the, the CPS in, in, in L.A. County, they want to settle, right, for like uh, $3 million, I believe, and uh, wrongful death. What happened was they had their baby, the, the, the parent's baby with them, and the, the child died in their custody, right? There was no, The parents didn't do anything to the child. It was the, the CPS did it. The foster home mm -hmm. did it. So anyways, they, they want them to settle, but the, the, the lawsuit was for more more than $3 million. They wanted them to settle, and then they wrote in the in the, the attorney, their attorney, civil attorney said, just settle, and you cannot make this public record, you cannot say anything, you cannot speak about this death, you cannot, but in order for her to get the $3 million, which that attorney is going to get a million from, you cannot discuss it, it's not public record. So she called me and asked me and Davis if that was true, that was they could do that because she didn't want to sign it like that. She wanted the media like um, Channel 5 contacted her. I think another TV station contacted her. Literally, they want to know what's going on. But again, they gave her this contract to sign and she doesn't know if she wants to sign it or not. And you just mentioned right now you made sure it's written down in there that, hey, this is not going to be private. This is going to be public. And you made sure it was public. So her yep. attorney did all this just to collect his money, I think, in my opinion, 
and uh, for her just to keep her mouth shut. That's just my opinion. Because otherwise, why would an attorney that is defending this client, right, um, knowing the corruption that just happened, and why would he do that, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, we lost attorney Matthew, and I'm not sure why. But I hope he comes back. If you guys have any questions in Texas, please address it in writing. Um, Jessica McDonald, I, I've been reading your comments, baby. Uh, um, if you don't mind, if you can um, email me your f or text me at 626-631-8901, your full name, and maybe you and I can have one-on-one -on -one talk about this um and also same thing goes for kelvin phillips um he said attorney harris can you address my question about terminating guardianship please we don't know what happened to attorney harris now um let me text him everyone hold on let me see what's going on uh Okay, here he is. I think he's back. Matthew, can you hear me? I can hear you just fine. I just texted you, actually. Yeah, I I don't know what happened. My camera died on me right there. Let me see if I can switch this thing over. Yeah, I'm on a backup. Camera. I'm on a Thank backup. Camera here, so I apologize if I don't have. A no, no, it's okay. So Kelvin Phillips asked a question. Um, he asked. Attorney Harris, can you address my question about terminating guardianship, please? Now, his question is, if I can go back, he said, ah, what steps would you re recommend in order, here it is, what steps would you recommend in order to file a motion to terminate a legal guardianship of maternal grandparents? Oh, a lot of that's going to depend on the state. Um mm -hmm. Let's and assume it's Texas. Let's assume it's Texas. It, well, if it's Texas, uh, I, and, and I'm not completely sure about um, where exactly. Here, I'm, I'm, I'm looking so that I can read this. I'm going to make sure I'm not misquoting. Okay. All right, give me one moment, Calvin. I'm finding it. All right, so in order to file a motion to terminate a legal guardianship, of maternal grandmother well if the parents rights have already been terminated and the maternal grandmother has i guess guardianship or possibly conservatorship mm -hmm. then um i don't know that the parent has standing to do that but if it's simply that the maternal grandmother has some custody rights of the child or I guess has conservatorship rights then it, in texas you would just simply file a presuming that the parents rights have not been terminated then you would file a motion to modify that pre-existing order yeah his parents her his parental rights is not is not terminated okay well if you so. still have parental rights then i'm presuming that you still have the ability to modify those whatever that prior order is right and you know, he just told told us earlier it's in Orange County. Kelvin, I we handle a lot of cases in Orange County. In fact, we have a client um, that just hired us for today in Orange County. I would like for you to call me at six two six six three one eight nine zero one, or you can text me at that number as well. Um, and I would like to speak to you and, and get a little bit more because Attorney Harrison in California, what I have noticed is that the Grandmother has rights, you know, legal guardianship to the children. However, CPS a few months later will go back and claim those kids and say that the grandmother failed to protect. So I don't know if you have cases like that there where they wait like five or, you know, three months or five months to remove those kids again. And then all of a sudden the case goes into TPR. Oh, uh, no, I, I don't know that I've seen anything like that where they seek a second removal after the children have been placed somewhere yeah um, that's that's heartbreaking i mean it is. your 
out of the you're out of the frying pan but just into the fire exactly but that's how they for example if they get a new foster home that wants to adopt that particular child or children then what they do is they come back with new allegations on that grandparent or grandparents and then they remove the children again they will it's it's endless attorney harris it, I so think did, if you're working with California, and, you'll understand a little bit more what it's more way more complex than I think Texas. Well, I don't know, but if, if California is the same way, but in Texas, there is the ability to uh, get your parental rights back after a termination. Well, you can get your parental rights back after term. We've stopped an adoption two weeks ago. Mm or two and a half weeks ago, rather. It was on a Friday, we were celebrating. We stopped wow. an adoption and that was very hard and, and other attorneys would not take it and it was very difficult. But again, it wasn't in, I don't think it was in LA County. I can't remember the name of the county, but um, it was attorney Joyce Vega that works with us in the office that stopped that adoption. Hmm. And attorney Vega is, you know, she's trained by attorney Davis, obviously, you know, what to do in situations like that. but. Oftentimes they tell parents after adoption, you cannot get your kids back or, you know, the case is in, in the process to, for the child to be adopted and you have no rights. But parents don't understand is that it costs money. It, co it does cost money to fight because of everything you have to file, everybody involved in your case, all this costs money. So if you're willing to stop the adoption, if you're willing, if you have the means for parents to help you or, or family members to help you do it you have a chance, do it. Mm -hmm. And the thing about it is what, what I don't know if you, if you notice this in your career, attorney Harris is that they tell usually social workers will separate the family members from each other. Meaning they will go to the grandmother and say, Oh, your son said this about you, that you molested him when he was young or, or the father was having, you know, fights with your child and beating him and you did not do anything to help him and he doesn't want the kids to be placed with you and of course the grandparents are gonna say oh that you know piece of crap ungrateful son of mine he did this he did that he did this and then they start talking among each other and you know separating the whole family so nobody can get financial help whatsoever oh absolutely i mean that's their that's their mo yeah they they intend to divide and conquer so that way the it, they have a more likely chance of success. I agree. Um, so attorney Matthew, I know you've, we've taken your time and I know you have work to do, but I do want to ask a question with everyone watching. Can you come back on the show again and continue this? Absolutely. I can. Yeah. We will coordinate a future date so that way we can keep talking about how to fight the good fight and protect parents' yeah. rights. Absolutely. And I know that there's a, a new laws. I'm sure I have to research, um, that I would like to ask you about also in the near, you know, when we meet again on the show. It would be my pleasure. Thank you so much, Attorney Harris. See you soon. All right. Bye, Chad. Bye. Okay, everyone. Um, so he's going to come back on the show. So Calvin, like I said, please contact me. Um, yeah, especially when chances of winning if you don't have an attorney very zero to be honest with you i mean it's very difficult to even answer that question because one out of a million maybe might win i don't know how but the cases are getting more complex social workers are getting more antsy to close a case immediately we have a case Today, for example, the child was removed like two weeks ago, and now they're in a TPR stage. Think about that for a second. A child was removed two weeks ago, and now they're in the TPR stage. And her TPR hearing is in August. Um, our client did not even go to one hearing. So she didn't even go to the detention hearing to begin with. So how was that possible? I have no idea. But again, they complicate cases and they are, if you guys noticed before there were a hundred steps ahead of you. Now they're 500 steps ahead of you. They're trying to close cases left and right like this. So for the money to come pouring in, 
if you guys notice also we pay federal tax that is also more than the state tax so the federal money keeps going to these people so these entities who steal our children are funded every day all the time so they want to get as many cases as possible what i've seen happening is they're moving faster than normal before they were moving moving fast but now it's way too fast okay this mother never had priors and this mother has a i think three older children she said who are in college they were triplets they're in college so if she's such a bad mom why wouldn't she have destroyed the other three right so again these are allegations that allegation with this mom that i spoke with today was from her neighbor stupid allegations but social workers took you know the children and now they're in a tpr stage it, it makes absolutely zero sense um for filing a motion to terminate guardianship yeah i need you to contact me kelvin again my direct number is 626-631-8901 that is my direct number you can text me it's better to text me because i do not just answer calls i don't have people uh names saved on my phone so if i have your name saved on my phone i know you're calling me um if i don't i will not answer the calls um joe said hello i have a question a judge is saying that she can not hear a reading on why the child should return home before the defendant is a okay is this true you know that is a good question joe and um i need to know a little bit more about that because oftentimes a judge would say what are the changes in circumstances for example you know we'll ask the attorney okay what are the changes in circumstances like what did the parent do you know to help him or her get the kids back something like that yeah something like that so again i need to know a little bit more and that's also um, a question for attorney davis but again i'm just telling you what attorney i'm I'm responding as attorney Davis responded on several shows. Emotional abuse. So if, if it was emotional abuse, I assume that you had to take classes, right? And, you know, some kind of classes to help you. And if that was the case, then it depends on how long you've taken the classes, um, if what type of classes you, you have completed, and that attorney that you have should be you know be able to submit that as hey our, my client completed his classes and what have you but again i need to know a little bit more about it um they always say emotional abuse not the case because they abuse the children not the parents she has refused to hear why the child should return because the offender isn't not oh i see okay so yeah you would definitely need to speak to attorney davis on that one okay because he's the uh the one with the plan and again if you guys have any more legal questions please address it to me in writing or you can email it and i'm gonna put my phone my direct number and my email address right now for everyone to see it Ms. G. Direct number six six three one nine zero one and and my email you guys is g a t at vincent w davis dot com so i'm posting this right now and you guys will have all the um, contact information for me and i can um I ac actually i can ask attorney davis myself if you can just address your question in writing um via text or email you guys so here it is right here miss g direct number and email address for you guys to email me your questions and what have you and 
Um, you have to, Joe, I would need to speak to you first to get more information about the matter. And then I will um, address it with Attorney Davis as well. Okay. And we'll see what we can do. Yeah, there's a lot of cases opening new cases right now, guys. You're very welcome, Jessica. I can't wait to hear from you. If you're using a different name than the name on the YouTube channel, please tell me both the name on the YouTube channel. And then underneath that, just say my legal name is. So I know who you are. Okay. And that goes for the rest of you as well, guys. Okay. So Joe is texting me right now. Let's see. Oh, damn. I have 28 text messages. Okay. Jessica, I got it. Got it. Thank you. Uh, I haven't gotten yours yet, Joe. Yeah, I don't have. I have Ariel. I have you. Okay. Yeah, Joe, I haven't gotten your, your text message yet, my love. Um, I'm texting now. Love you, Miss G. Love you too, underdog. Actually, email in details. Email is good too, my love. And Stacy, I haven't forgotten about you, but I just didn't want to distract Attorney Matthew Harris. But I love you. I miss you so much. I can't wait to have you back. It is my real name. Oh, okay. Got it. Here, I got it. Joe. Okay, yeah, Joe, you texted me back on March 3rd and you asked me if Attorney Davis has a show. Now I know because when you texted me, now I know who you are. Um, yeah, we'll talk. I'll, I'll be able to talk to you, definitely. So, guys, when I do talk to you or when I do get your text messages, give me some time to call you and if i do call you and you guys don't answer the call i have to call other parents so just know that i want to reach each and every one of you so if you get a call from me at nine o'clock p.m please understand that i do work after work hours i dedicate those hours to you guys because i want to try to help everyone i can so don't be mean you know just if you can't talk just text me back and say miss g can we talk tomorrow? It's kind of late right now because I do work longer hours, but that's only if I have parents who need help, right? So again, I dedicate those hours to you guys. So try to be a little kind. Uh, Jessica, yes, please save my number. So that way when I call you, but wait, I need to address this one. This is so important. When I call you guys, it doesn't show my direct number. When I call you guys, it shows the office number. So my phone, my work phone, my direct number goes to me, right? Straight to me. But when I call any outside calls, it goes to the, it comes from the office number. So if you see the office number, a 626 number, but you don't see the rest of the numbers as being me, that's me. Okay. But if you're texting me, you text me at my direct number that you see on the screen right now, which I already received 25 text messages already since the show. Um, yeah. And then save my number. So that way you'll know. So save my work number as work number and then save my number as personal direct number. So that way you'll know it's me and, and when I call, whether it's from the office or uh, texting you. Um, and underdog, I do love you so much. I miss you so much. Uh, Joe said email. Okay. You saw the email details, right? Actually email de details in details. Gotcha. Okay. Um, okay. Ellie said, I've been trying to call and get no answer. Ali, I'm so sorry, baby, but you have my number now. So here again, let's post it. Where are me? Oh, here we go. Here it is. So you have now my direct number and you have my email. Okay. So this is my email and this is my direct number. Just text me. 
um, just text me, guys. It doesn't matter what time it is. Um, you can email me, obviously, anytime. Um, text messages, I get uh, text messages all hours of nights. Um, yesterday, for example, I was on the phone with a, um, a parent that's in Iowa. And we've been, we were talking and, and I was able to direct her to the right place for her case. I got a message just now. Hi, Ms. G. Do you help with family law? This is Ellie. Yes, we do help with family law. Now, remember this. And I actually do want to do I want another show about this. Um, oftentimes, when you have a, a family law case that is a complex, complex case, it turns into a CPS case. Okay. Uh, the reason it turns into a CPS case, because when it's conflict and you have minor children, remember minor children, anyone under age 18. And if you have a special need child, that child, I guess the special need child is always going to be top priority to the court um, because they cannot defend themselves. So be careful when it comes to family law cases, because it turns really sour if you don't have the right attorney for family law cases that is a high conflict case you need an aggressive attorney none of this nice let's get together type of attorney i'm sorry that that crap doesn't work in family court you need an aggressive attorney that understands cps laws and that understands family laws court so the reason i'm saying this is because that defense attorney knows both sides and he or she will understand how to stop it from getting to that point where the state takes over. So you need an attorney. If you have a case that involves minors, you need a competent attorney that understand both um, cases, family law and state. That is very important. Um, Ellie. Okay, here we go. Got it. Yep. So you understand what I said. Ali just texted me. And yes, she does need an aggressive attorney. You got it. Um, what the, when I say aggressive, the attorney is not going to go there with, you know, handcuffs and arresting everybody or a weapon. Aggressive in his way or her way in a way where she knows what she's doing or he knows what he's doing. Right. Um, but they're not. Mr. or Mrs. Nice Guy. Um, Jessica said, just followed on Facebook as well. If I go live and tell my story and start to go find me, fund, I guess, fund me, she meant to say, or will it hurt my case? You know what? That's a good question. And, um, it depends how far your case is right now. That's why I need to speak with you first, Jessica. Um, as long as you're not mentioning the social workers' names, you know, the ones who corrupt, who are corrupt, mention their names or what have you, and uh, maybe just share your story without sharing the county and the state and what have you, you know, if you want. Oftentimes what I see people doing is using a different name. You know, they use like their screen name from YouTube channel or something like that. It's instead of using their real actual legal name. And they do expose and they do involve themselves to stop a lot of parents from making following the same mistakes they've made, stuff like that. They want to bring awareness alongside me and what have you. Um, so your case is two years in. So I'm assuming you lost your parental rights. Or you're losing your parental rights. If you can just share that with me, that'd be great. Uh, if you're, yeah, there is a a client um, that had a family law case and that turned into CPS case. She told me that she hired um, an attorney from LA County. She said she's a mediator attorney. Uh, I don't know, mediation attorney, I guess, um, me, like to mediate between you and the other party. But if it's a high conflict case, a high custody divorce conflict case, 
my me, if it was me, I would not hire anyone but a CPS defense attorney that understands family law cases and understands CPS cases. That is very important. If you have minor children, you need to protect them. One attorney that understands both sides. Okay? Because oftentimes you hire a family law attorney. That family law attorney is, you know, miss peacemaking, mediation, you know, mediator. Um, that person would not know what to do in a CPS case. They don't know. Because I guarantee you that family law attorney would tell you the following. Now nah, you're not going to see your kids until they're 18. It's too late. It's exactly what they're going to say. And don't believe that crap. They just don't know. They just don't know. And they should never answer this question. They never, ever answer questions like that. Um, Jessica wrote, no, it's still reunification on the table. But the whole situation was my husband, my husband's drug use. And we were in a shootout oftentimes jessica they say that the parent is in a reunification stage and it's not true it's not true they already like i said they're 500 steps ahead of you while you think you're dealing with step 50 they already know what step they're under right the reunification crap is just a name to give you false hope that's why i call them demonic they're literally demonic entities. They don't want to see reunification because if they wanted to reunify you with your children, it would not take two years. Attorney Davis said this several times on his shows, and I asked him that. I, I literally asked him. He said, if that was the case, why were the children reunified two years ago or at least a year and six months ago? Right? Why would it take them that long for unifications? It makes no sense. Taking them that long because they're prolonging the case. So the judge can come back and say, well, Miss So and so, it will be traumatizing to the children to be removed from a safe home that they've been in for two years. When it's not your fault that the case took on two years. Let me know if I'm wrong. I'm just letting you know. Okay, I'm glad you agree because that's what they do. Jessica, that's what they do. I literally dedicate my life to doing whatever I can to help parents because what they do is is gangster. Literally gangster style. And they do it with a smile on their face. They do it with a smile on their face. They don't care about your emotions, they don't care about you being a parent, they don't care about any of that stuff. Joe said, there seems to be a lot of things being left out about the process that people should know when they take your child. Okay. Let me repeat what Attorney Matthew and Attorney Davis says. Now, Attorney Matthew is in Texas. Texas laws are different than California. Okay, remember that. Okay. When the initial drop a business card, for example, you come home and you have a business card from a social worker. Attorney Davis always recommends never to contact them without having an attorney. Reason for that is because what we see in California happening is that the parent contacts the social worker, telling them, hey, I have nothing to hide. You're more than welcome to come over and see my home and talk to my children and blah, 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 blah. Right? Now, when the social worker comes over and start talking to the parent, they want the parents to answer questions. When the parent says, I'm sorry, I don't want to answer that unless my attorney is present, because my attorney is not present, um, can we set a meeting or what have you, a time and date where we can all be present? The, 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 the social worker will go around it saying, okay, well, you know, we just want to hurry up and close the case. You know, we know you're not the bad parent. We just have to do our job. We have to look to see if you have food and you have this and everything looks great. You're a great mom. All right, all right. Have a good day. I'm going to, you know, close the case. Then the social worker a day later comes back with the police department and a warrant. I mean, a police officer and a warrant or a sheriff and a warrant or no warrant. And then if you refuse 
for them to take the children without a warrant, then she will go back and say, there's imminent danger. We received a report that says the child is is, is uh, being abused, et cetera, et cetera. And then the judge signs off on the order. And then that social worker comes back and does the removal. Again, that's why it's best for you not to speak to them without an attorney. Once you have an attorney present, they will take their sweet time removing your children. Okay. Because they're just going to come up with new allegations and they, they, they want to set you up some more. They will send you different social workers who are such an easy peasy group of people who are so sweet and so kind. But all that is fake. They just want to trap you. They want you to think you don't need your attorney present. They want you to think you can rely on them and trust them. Okay. So they use different demonic strategy all the time to get what they want. So if you, I know you guys heard this, Attorney Davis say this many times, you have more rights as a criminal than you do as a, a parent. Think about that for a second. In a criminal matter, in a, in a criminal case, hearsay doesn't work without evidence. In a CPS case, hearsay works only for the social workers, not the parents. Okay. Again, hearsay only works for the social workers, not the parents. So this is why we recommend you lawyer lawyering up. Another bad state is New York. I had attorney Michael on my show from New York and he's under the weather right now. He's not feeling good, but I want to, I'm going to check up on him later. Um, he always says, never, ever speak to a social worker without lawyering up. Because your retainer is going to be a lot cheaper than if you wait until it's an open CPS case. Because they ask you questions, they will take your answers, they're going to twist your answer, and they're going to write something completely different. A lot of parents, when they get copies of their report, they cry to me and say, Ms. G, we never said that. We never said this. We never said that. But again, they have evidence, like example, the ring camera or whatever camera you have, security cameras, if you recorded them, then your court appointed attorney does not submit those evidence into case. And say you come into the end of your case and you want to appeal. You can't use those evidence in the case that you're appealing, right? Because it wasn't entered into court as evidence. That is why it's important, Attorney Davis says, to enter evidence into court once you have them because when you appeal and you have evidence and it was submitted into court already then you you can literally appeal those evidence using those evidence as exhibits okay i'm just trying to explain it the best way i can you have to do things accordingly when it comes to cps cases this is why it's very important to lawyer up. Now, if you're in a CPS investigation phase, for example, and you say you hired an attorney, our attorney, for example, cannot communicate with the social workers. Attorney Davis will communicate, their attorney will communicate with attorney Davis. And then if there's a CFT meeting, then all parties have to agree on that CFT meeting on the date and time. Why? Because attorney Davis always says, do not do a CFT meeting without him. Even if you're, like example, Joyce Vega is, is helping you, for example, and say Joyce Vega has a hearing that day, then Attorney Davis will take over and be on the phone, you know, at least listening to the questions they're asking you. Now, if they're asking you questions that are, that's going to trick you, they're trying to trick you, then Attorney Davis will say, you know what? No, I'm not going to have my client answer that. Don't answer that question, for example. Okay? Um, this is why it's important to have an attorney a lot cheaper, a lot cheaper, you guys, and, and that to ensure that your children are not removed. Remember that ensure your children are not removed, that the retainer for that is only for that matter, an investigation matter. If it becomes an open CPS case, then that's a whole new agreement. That's a whole new retainer. Okay. Now. The kids are ward, the award award of the state. Okay. 
So this is why it's important to understand. Okay, so there is, um, an, I have another five minutes and then I have to end the show. But if you guys have any more questions, please, again, send them to me via email or you can text me. Um, and here's my information again. Hold on. Okay. So use those direct um, information that I have for me, direct way to contact me. And please, if you email me, make sure you put your full name, full legal name, please. And uh, so that way I know who I'm speaking with. All right, guys, thank you so much for joining me. I will see you guys tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow is at 1.30 p.m. Tomorrow's Friday. Relatives fight CPS with Miss G. Um, that show is very... Uh, highly recommended for people who CPS turned against families that CPS turned against themselves, basically to separate you from your families by spreading rumors and lies that didn't happen. If that's the case, please share the link with your family members as well to watch. It depends, Joe. That's why it's important. Um, you know, let me see what I can do to have Attorney Davis speak with you. But again, we'll talk after the show. Again, if you don't hear from me right away, you will get a text from me and I will let you guys know I'm on the phone or I have five people ahead of you or six people ahead of you. But again, if I call and you guys don't answer, I have to move on to the next uh, parent. Okay, so I hope you guys understand that. Um, that doesn't mean I will never contact you again. It just means that I have to call as many as possible to help them as well. Okay? God bless you guys. I love all of you. I'm praying for all of you. And again, I'll see you guys tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. with Relatives Fight CPS with Miss G. God bless. Bye-bye.